wonderful day today, worshiping the Lord and celebrating his resurrection. I'm glad to see you back tonight doing the same. So let's all stand, stand together and we're going to sing together. We're going to sing this great old hymn, Christ Arose. And what a good melody and tune it is as we think about Jesus living today. And so let's really sing it out tonight. Amen. We sing it soft on the verse and get really loud on the chorus. Sing with me low. Death cannot keep his prey. Let's sing the third together.
Wish we could say to you that we had somebody saved today, but we did not have any professions of faith today. But I can say this, the gospel was proclaimed and given as clearly as we can. And we trust the Lord to give the increase. And we believe that the Lord, if he is lifted up, he will draw men to himself. And that's what we've tried to do today. And it wasn't, wasn't the Lord magnified in the music that you heard today. And I just want to publicly just thank the choir and the orchestra and all that were involved in that. And I just think it would be fitting to just let them know our appreciation and all that they did to magnify the Lord today. And I know you'll get to hear them again tonight as they want to sing about the Lord. Uh, but let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are risen from the dead. And because you have risen from the dead, we recognize that you are Lord. And because of that, we realize that we, we need to obey you. And we know that you have never commanded us to do something that would be bad for us. And so I pray that you would teach us humility and give us faith and grace to obey. And I just thank you for the gospel that changes lives as well. And I pray that we would continue to preach and proclaim the gospel and that we would be able to see people get saved. And Lord, we just thank you for how you're building your church and the way that you're working. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And it was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And the angel said unto them, I seek ye the living among the dead. He is not here, but is risen. Thank you. 
love how that sets up the story of the resurrection and rejoices in all that he's done and that we can be born again. Let's all sing together. Because he lives, I'm thankful tonight. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's all stand and sing Because he lives. You may be seen. Amen. Well, I, I praise the Lord that the Lord lives and He's still working today. You know, I think we hear a lot of negative news, and you just uh, understand how a lot of people are turning their back on faith, and the fastest growing religion in America is no religion, and those kind of things. But I really believe that, that God is alive and He is at work in the hearts and lives of people today. And I believe if you're preaching the truth, there are people that are hungry. Uh, to hear the truth, and I'm saying all that just to say what a blessed day we had here, and I know some of my closer preacher friends, I was just reaching out to them to see how their day went, and you know, several of my friends is the highest attendance that they've had, and just how, how the Lord is working and moving, uh, not just here, but in all sorts of places uh, around the country and around the world, and we rejoice in that. Uh, again, I know it's not about numbers, we say that here, and we mean that. But numbers allow us to just kind of analyze and see things. And so, again, I've been pastor here for a little over eight years, and the largest attendance we've had in any service was this morning. 672 people were here in our services today, and I praise the Lord for that. Well, we can celebrate that. Um, but the reason I'm bringing that number up is just I want to keep in front of you uh, the presentation that we gave last Sunday night about the need for uh, seating. If you were in the auditorium today... Uh, you saw that there's a need for seating. And uh, just to, it, I'm thankful for how the Lord works in certain ways because I believe He confirmed a lot of our, our numbers. I want to share this with you. Uh, in the auditorium today, just in the auditorium, not counting all of our children's programs and nurseries, in the auditorium today, not counting the people that stayed on the platform, not everybody stayed on the platform, but uh, most of the choir stayed up, some of the orchestra stayed up. Without the choir, we had 445 people in the auditorium today. That's, that's what we had out here in the seats. Now keep that in perspective. We put out additional seats in the balcony along the backs and so forth. And so if you take out the 28 people that were sitting in chairs that were put out, that means we had 417 people in the, the pews and the seats that are, that are allocated for that. Now if you'll remember... We kind of did a study and we, we came to the conclusion that 415 
was our max capacity in our pews. And so, uh, I, I'm just thankful that it, it confirmed the accuracy of what we were predicting. Now you say, well, I know we could have fit a few more in there. Well, I, I realize that too, but I mean, I think we, we saw uh, how it felt with having 415 people in these pews. And I will say this, sadly, uh, we did have a family that left. Uh, they, they came and uh, our ushers were doing their job. They asked them to wait right there. They went and they asked the faithful member to, to give up their seat. And our faithful member was more than happy to do that. But when the family that was visiting realized what was happening, they said, we don't want to displace anybody. And they literally went back and picked their kids up from the nursery and left. And uh, yeah, that hurts our hearts and we, we don't like that and we don't want that. And so again, uh, just presenting to you the need, I mean, for, for a day like today, um, if we're going to continue to grow the way we have been growing and be able to accommodate the people as they come, to have 526 seats that can be schematically proven, can be put in here, uh, not only would that give us the additional seating capacity, but it would help our ushers. I think you could see on a day like today, just trying to find a spot for somebody, uh, it would just make it so much more clearer that, hey, we've got four seats here, five seats here, and we're, we're able to accommodate uh, the people that God is sending our way. And so, again, just trying to, to uh, keep that in front of you. And so keep in mind, next Sunday night after the service, we're planning on voting on this project. I uh, presented it to everyone last Sunday night uh, for the seating capacity change and the cost involved in that. And so if you have any questions or concerns, I really, really implore you to, to come speak to me, talk to uh, Brother Corey. He's done a lot of research and help with this as well. Talk to any of our deacons. Uh, we want full disclosure and transparency. We want to answer your questions and concerns, and uh, I hope that you feel comfortable in that. Uh, but just be reminded, next Sunday night we'll be voting on that. Let me give you some uh, other announcements. I want to continue to pray for Liz Holmes and Christy Daniel and Miss Harriet. Good to see Miss Harriet tonight. Glad you're here uh, after, after her surgery. Pray for Catherine Armanot having surgery on the 9th and continuing to pray for her. And uh, praise the Lord for our Bible clubs. Because of Good Friday, Robert Anderson didn't meet, but we had a total of 103 students that we were able to minister to this week. And we had one saved at our Good News Club at Whitehall Elementary School. And so we praise God for that. Uh, don't forget uh, outreach. And uh, by the way, I just want to say thank you to everybody that participated in the Easter outreach. Uh, I've, I've said to you, we can't control how many people come, but we can control how many people we invite. And we invited a lot of people. Our church was able to pass out all 8,000 of our invitations. And I know there's probably a few floating around in cars here and there. But for the most part, we, we passed out all 8,000 invitations. I appreciate everybody that got involved in doing that. And that was awesome. We had 6,000 mailers. That's 14,000 invitations that went to people. We also advertised on Facebook. And we're just trying to utilize media outlets. You know, you can complain about how bad me the media is, but why not use it for the sake of the gospel? And so we praise the Lord for, for uh, your, your help in the outreach there. And I believe the Lord was honored and the Lord blessed that. And, you know, by the way, if you have somebody say, well, I know somebody complained about that. So what? I don't care. Complain on, you know. I'm trying to get the gospel out, and the gospel sometimes offends people. And I'm not going to be deterred by some crank on Facebook that didn't like that they got a mailer in their, in their mailbox inviting them to Easter Sunday. I just really don't care about that at all. But anyway. Uh, uh, I just want to remind you as well, uh, uh, those of you that put out yard signs, um, if you can help us out, I don't want to be tacky, so um, Easter's over, so make sure you pick them up and uh, dispose of them properly. Uh, if you were able to put one of those yard signs out, I would appreciate that very, very much. How many of it annoys you when you go by a church and on their church sign they're advertising a revival meeting that took place three months ago? Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. But anyway, uh, help us out. That would be much appreciated. On April the 4th at 10 o'clock, there's going to be a women's Bible study in the Oak with Joanne Nix. We hope that you can join there. Uh, the ladies' table talks will be on the 16th. So we got some ladies' meetings for you if you'd like to join there. Ladies' table talks will be at 2.30 on the 16th in the Oak as well. They're asking you to bring some... Uh, canned green beans and corn for the ministry that they're working on. Uh, I mentioned to you Mike Bale's class is uh, watching a documentary in the Oak uh, on the church and the government, and it has to do a lot with what happened in COVID. I recently heard an interview with John MacArthur. He said that the Grace Church there in California has increased by 3,000 members over the COVID issue because he didn't close down, and I think that that's very interesting, and I praise the Lord that there, again, are still people out there seeking the truth and uh, want, want to have good, good spiritual leadership. Uh, don't forget to stay uh, current in your bulletin for the other activities. If you're planning to go to the Men's Advance in, New, in, in Georgia, Jefferson County, Georgia, 
I would love for you to sign up for that. I'd love to take a good group. I think right now we only have about 10 or 12 guys signed up. I'd love to do a better job than that. So if your schedule allows you to do it, uh, please go ahead and get signed up for that. We're going to have a good time of fellowship, good preaching, and those kind of things. And uh, gentlemen, if you want to go ahead and come forward, we'll receive our offering. Uh, also, don't forget about the men's boys camp out. The registration is live on that. I'm sorry to pack so many things to sign up for at this time. Uh, but uh, we want to get ready for the summer there and make sure that we have the space uh, reserved for the men's boys camp out. And of course, I'll remind you, men's boys camp out is for uh, all men and boys of all ages. Uh, of course, if your kids are minors, you, you need to be there to kind of chaperone them. Uh, but uh, otherwise, we want everybody to come. So even your little guys, they have a great time. It's good for them. They get dirty. Uh, they, they play in the dirt. They try and catch frogs and whatever. They, it's really good for them. And so I want you to be, be there. It's good for them to be around other men who are also dirty and stinky as well. And so it's really, really a good time. And we have some spiritual challenges and just to hope that you'll be there. Um, so again, I ho hope I'm not missing anything, uh, but stay current in your bulletin. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray uh, that you would use uh, what is given today to further the gospel. And we certainly thank you for the way that you're working in our church and our ministry. And uh, please, I pray that you'd help us to be rooted, help, help us to just be grounded in the truth and mature in our faith. And that would produce a unity amongst us as we try to shine brightly for you in our community here. And I just pray that you would be pleased tonight by the way we give and the reason we give. And I also pray that you would bless the preaching and teaching to follow. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Find your text tonight in Galatians chapter 2. Appreciate it, girls, and good to have some of you home from school. Uh, so glad Kaylin and Carter, I thought I saw him. There he is, and uh, glad to see you, and uh, so glad that you guys were home today and celebrating Easter with us. You'll find your text, Galatians chapter 2, and we've been studying Galatians on Sunday nights. I've been excited about that, and uh, we'll get right into it this evening. Before the message uh, this evening, Brother Baker is going to come and sing, and so if you'll come and make ready. And before uh, he comes to sing and I come to preach, let's pause for a moment and let's just worship the Lord because he is risen and he is alive, working in our hearts and our lives. And let's ask him to speak to us tonight.
Heavenly Father, I praise you for being a living God, and we know that because you're alive and well, that you're working and moving in the hearts of your people, and that people are constantly being saved and coming to you, and people are constantly growing in their faith and roots going down deeper. And we thank you for the work that you're doing. Even in the darkness around us, we know that the darkness cannot overshadow the light, and we rejoice in you, and we worship you. And I pray tonight that you would, because you're alive, you would speak once again, as you have so many times in this place, through the preaching and teaching of your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be moving and working in our hearts, and that we would be receptive to listen. Lord, we sure do love you and thank you for your, your grace toward us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus walked the road to Calvary, paid the sinner's debt. The disciples' hearts were broken. Jesus' mother wept on that dark and dreary day. God the Father turned away. See the hope of all the ages silent in the grave. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming, the sky is dark, yet the th another day is coming, it's not over yet. King Jesus will reveil, oh yes, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Every day the wicked prosper, Good men suffer pain. Satan seems to gain the victory, mocking Jesus' name. Many Christians suffer so, and their tears of sorrow flow. Is the God of all the ages still on heaven's throne? It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. The sky is dark. But soon another day is dawning, it's not over yet. King Jesus will prevail, oh yes, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. When you come to death's dark valley, feeling pain and loss, just remember Christ your Savior on his rugged cross. Though he died in darkest gloom, Jesus left an empty tomb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Christ is coming soon. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming, the sky is dark. But soon another day is dawning, it's not over yet. King Jesus will prevail, oh yes, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming, oh yes, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. Hey Amen. Can't you imagine? I, I've thought about this today. I was just just meditating, spent some time with the Lord. And, you know, we are living by faith. We didn't see him. We didn't see the empty tomb. We, we didn't see him. And so the Bible says, blessed are those that, that, have, that believe and have not seen. And we're kind of on the other side of the story, right? But we didn't physically see him, but yet we believe and we know the end of the story. We know that the tomb is empty and we know that he's coming again. Can you imagine the trepidation and and the feeling that these men had who did see him die. They, they watched him die. And, uh, you know, regardless of whether, what day you believe he died on, I mean, they watched him die. They know he was dead. And I can't imagine the despair and the despondency that was in their life. But, man, the joy. When they came to the tomb and it was empty. And he is alive. He is as risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord once laid. He's not here. And man, can you imagine that? Well, let's stand together. We'll get into our study tonight. Galatians chapter 2. Let's begin reading in verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> As we study this great letter that Paul wrote to the churches in the region of Galatia. 
And of course, you know the context. You know that there have been people that are infiltrating these churches, teaching that it's faith in Jesus Christ plus the law of Moses. And so begin reading in verse 1. It says, Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. See, what he's saying is, I wanted them to know the message that I was preaching. And he's going to make the case in here, listen, I wasn't preaching a different message because he, he made the case in chapter 1. There's only one gospel. And so I was telling them what I was preaching. And it's the same thing that they're preaching, salvation in Christ through faith and Christ alone. And so he says, I communicated that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that, because of false brethren unawares brought in, it's kind of getting the idea that these guys snuck into this meeting. You know, I just want to imagine like a business meeting in the South where the church runs, you know, 50, and there are 150 at the business meeting because everybody who says they go to the church shows up to vote. Like these people are just kind of sneaking in here to give their two cents. They were unawares brought in who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. You know what he's saying? I wasn't buying what they were selling. Wasn't going to budge. Wasn't going to budge about it. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. <laughs> Paul, Paul just had an edge to him that I kind of like, honestly. He said, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. They didn't change my mind at all. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. And again, I want you to understand, it's not two different gospels. He's just saying that the gospel went to two different groups. All right? And he says, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. And only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. All right, so I want to preach to you tonight based on that, that, that little phrase. Did you notice in verse 9, perceived the grace? So I want to talk about knowing and showing grace, knowing and showing grace. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd help me to preach tonight, give me liberty, and just help us all to be receptive to the truth, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing so long, you may be seated. <coughs> well, two of the greatest preachers that ever lived pastored at the same time in close proximity in London, and that would have been Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker. Both of them were published in periodicals of their day, they were well-known, large ministries right there in the city of London, and uh, they, they were... Of course, well-renowned and God really blessed. One day, Parker made a comment. And remember, Charles Spurgeon, he had a Bible college and an orphanage and other ministries. And one day, Parker commented on the poor condition of the children that were admitted to Spurgeon's orphanage. He, just, he made a comment about their poor condition. But it was reported back to Spurgeon that Parker had been critical of the, of the orphanage. How many of you are mature enough and old enough to know that sometimes when you hear something, it's not exactly accurate to what really happened. How many you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so when that took place, Spurgeon, who, who was a man, although he's a great man, he was a man, he blasted Parker the next week from the pulpit. I mean, he, he got up and he blasted him because he was, you know, criticizing their orphanage and he just really let Parker have it. And this attack was printed in the newspaper and really became the, the, the talk of the town. So what happened is the next week, there was a large number of people that went to Joseph Parker's church because they wanted to hear what he was going to say in rebuttal to what Spurgeon had said the week before in his pulpit. Well, they were in a surprise when Parker bounded up to the pulpit and began to speak, and he said this. I understand that Dr. Spurgeon is not in the pulpit today, and this is the Sunday that they used to take up an offering for the orphanage. I suggest that we take a love offering for them here as well. And they passed the plates. The crowd was delighted, and the ushers had to empty the offering plates three times to collect the offering that went towards Spurgeon's orphanage. Later that week, there was a knock on Parker's study. When Joseph Parker opened the door, Charles Spurgeon was standing there in person. 
And this is what he said. It's an amazing quote, amazing story. He looked at Joseph Parker and he said, You know, Parker, you have practiced grace on me. You have given me not what I deserved, but you have given me what I needed. Isn't that an awesome story? I love that phrase. You have practiced grace on me. You understand the ability to perceive grace, the ability to practice grace, is something that we all need in this day and age. Can I tell you tonight, and I, I plan to preach a little bit, uh, but it's easy to get pre preoccupied with non-grace, isn't it? It's very easy to look around us. That's why I want to just uh, caution you as a pastor. Be careful just scrolling and looking on, on social media. You know what you see a lot on social media in the posts of people? You see a lot of non-grace. Amen. And it's very easy to get preoccupied with something. I'm just going to tell you tonight, I, even in our own ministry, it bothers me sometimes when, when some teenager does something that's immature and everybody wants to jump on the immature one and, and label the entire group as being non-Christian. Amen. Look, how many of you did immature things when you were teenagers? Everybody raise your hand if you're past teenage years. Come on. And yet we want to focus and target on the non-grace and not see the grace that is taking place. Can I tell you tonight, hummingbirds look for flowers and vultures look for carcasses. And each bird finds exactly what they're looking for. I don't know about you, I'd rather be a hummingbird than a vulture. I'd rather find and perceive the grace instead of perceiving the non-grace. A friend of mine asked this question recently. I thought it was awesome. He said, what is it about your complaint that is so significant that it deserves to change the focus of your church from Christ to you? Yeah, that is a convicting question. So we come back to Galatians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 10, and it's a personal description of the council at Jerusalem that is found in Acts chapter 15. At the heart of this debate was the truth of the gospel. He said that in verse 5. And I love that expression. I circled it in my Bible. The truth of the gospel. You see, Paul was more interested in the truth of the gospel than he was peace at the church. Now, I think most churches today just don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. They don't want to get anybody upset. They want peace at any price. And that's not how the apostle Paul rolled. Listen, I want you to understand, I don't think we ought to stir up trouble and look for trouble and start trouble. Nobody wants trouble. But I'm simply saying we should not be peace at any price. We should make sure that we understand that, listen, the truth of the gospel is so much important, more important than, than unity or peace in the church. I just recently, I was sharing with our Sunday school class, I read a fantastic book. It was a blessing to me. It might not be of great interest to you because it was more of a preacher book, but it was a, a little bit of a shorter biography comparing the kind of competition and controversy between George W. Truett and J. Frank Norris, two pastors, a pastor in Fort Worth, Texas, and Dallas, Texas, the kind of their rivalry. It was a very interesting, interesting read. And, and J. Frank Norris is a very controversial figure, and a lot of people consider him a rascal and, and, and a troublemaker and those kind of things. But one thing that the book kept highlighting and emphasizing is that J. Frank Norris was more interested in doctrinal purity than he was denominational loyalty. See, both I'm not chasing after anybody. They both of them were Southern Baptists, and both of them had impact within the Southern Baptist Convention. But one of the reasons why a lot of people didn't like J. Frank Norris is he didn't care about do, uh, denominational loyalty. What he cared about was doctrinal purity. And I don't know about what he, what he was like and if he was a rascal and he was a jerk face. I don't know. But I know this. Doctrinal integrity is more important than denominational loyalty. And Paul was that way. I mean, he saw the issue plainly. He came into this meeting and he said, listen, some of these people were important people, but they didn't impress me that much because I wasn't interested in who you were and how important you were and how much power you had and how significant of an individual, how big your church was. He said, to me, the truth of the gospel was what made the difference, what was important to me. You see, to him, it wasn't a matter of Jewish customs or Gentile customs. It was of fundamental importance regarding the truth of the gospel. You see, having believed in Jesus... Gentiles had been accepted by God in Christ, and to him that was enough. It didn't matter to him if you were a Jew. It didn't matter to him if you were a Gentile. It didn't matter to him if you were formerly a pagan, if you were formerly a, a Pharisee. It made no difference to him. If you believed in Jesus Christ, then you were accepted by God in Christ, and that was enough. And he said nothing further was needed or necessary for salvation. That's what he believed. That's what we believe. And so he comes to this meeting. 
And, and you gather from these 10 verses here that this was an intense meeting. Now, I imagine if Paul was involved in it, it was intense. It was an intense meeting, and it was an important meeting. And can you imagine the people that were in this room? I'm always blown away about that thing's in history. One time I took a tour of a, uh, the, uh, Jefferson Davis's house in Richmond, Virginia. And when he was on the run from the Union Army during the time of the Civil War, uh, the, the Union soldiers came in and, and took over his house, and they were traveling with Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln, there was this little tiny room in that house, and they said Abraham Lincoln, uh, just passing through, stopped in, and he ate his lunch in this room. And we were standing in that room. It was a little room. I was standing there with me. I thought, this is so cool. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was eating his peanut butter and jelly sandwich right here at this table. And I thought, man, the th could you imagine the, the things that talked about and took place in this room. Could you imagine the meeting between the Apostle Paul, Peter, James, and John? These are significant people right here in this room. Now let me clarify. The James here, there's a lot of Jameses, so you want to be careful. The James here was not one of the 12 disciples, James. This was the half-brother of Jesus, James. So if you're not familiar with that, James, the half-brother of Jesus, was the pastor of the church, the large church in Jerusalem. James was the one that wrote the epistle in your Bible the half-brother of Jesus. He was a significant individual. And, and here you have James, the half-brother of Jesus, the leader of this great church. You have Peter. I mean, Peter, you know Peter. And then you have John, the beloved. I mean, man, John, the beloved, the, this, this very signal, the closest person, the humanly speaking, to Jesus in all the world. And Paul, all in this room, having a discussion. And he call, I, I love how Paul calls them pillars. And so the question is, what? Would these pillars, what conclusion would they come to? And it says there in verse 9 that they perceived the grace. They recognized that Paul, wow, you know, I, I see grace in Paul's life. I see grace in Titus. I see grace in this gospel ministry. I see grace all over this. They perceived, they saw grace. Now, I've said this quote to you on several occasions. I'll say it again here tonight. Those that know grace, show grace. And I think that it's awesome. You have Peter, James, and John, men who were recipients of God's grace. You have Paul, I mean, recipient of God's grace, who should have been struck down dead on the road to Damascus, but instead he found salvation on the road to Damascus. These men knew grace, and they were demanded to show grace in their life. And it was perceived, it was saw. So I want to ask you the question, I will get into the sermon. What does grace look like? How do you recognize it when you see it? When was the last time you saw grace? So I want to just point out a few observations from our text and make application of it tonight. I want to give you two ways that grace can be perceived by others. Now, of course, this is not an exhaustive list. We believe in expositional preaching, so we try and take our, our, our points right from the text. And so we're going to preach what the Bible says. Even though there are other ways that you could perceive and practice grace, I just want you to see the two ways that I observed it here in our text. Number one, grace is seen in investing in others. It's seen by investing in others. Look at verse one with me, please. It says, then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So here's what we got. When Paul returned to Jerusalem, he was with Barnabas and Titus. Now, I want to tell you, that was quite a group of investors. Think about this tonight. Pa Barnabas had invested in Paul. Look, you, you know the story. We studied the life of Paul. We've been doing that on Sunday mornings for quite some time. And, and Paul has made mention of his past in chapter 1 already in the book of Galatians. We, we, it coincides with what we've seen in Acts 25 and 26 as well. Remember, Paul was, was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. He was a passionate, zealous uh, Ju Judaizer. And so he was passionate about the law. And his goal and passion in life had been really to destroy the church. That's what he was interested in. But all of that changed on the Damascus road when Jesus called him out. And as a result of meeting Jesus on that road, there had been a great change in his life. I'm talking about well, there no more of a 180 has been done in somebody's life than in Apostle Paul. And there was a great change in him. But when Paul desired to join the other followers of Jesus, here's the testimony that it says in the Bible, in the book of Acts, it says they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Well, you can understand that. That is a reasonable fear, by the way. This wasn't a bunch of Christians acting badly. This made sense. 
This is a man who probably had killed some of the people that they knew, imprisoned some of the people that they loved. This was a, he was a bad person as far as Christians were concerned, killing them, persecuting them, charging them. And so you can understand when he shows up in the congregation saying, hey, what hymns are we singing tonight? Everybody's going, yee. And I can see somebody going, well, they shouldn't have treated him that way. Listen, you know the rest of the story. Had you been in that congregation that day, you wouldn't have wanted to sit by Paul. You'd have been scared out of your mind. I can understand why they responded that way. But you can also praise the Lord that Paul responded the way he did. I mean, it would be reasonable again if, if Paul might have said something like this. Well, if that's how all Christians are, then who needs them? I, mean, I, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be around them. And he could have he went on in his way. But aren't you thankful that God has those special people in our life? And one of those was Barnabas. Listen, Barnabas had nothing to gain personally from befriending and investing in Paul. Nothing. But what he did, he did because it was the right thing to do. And he goes after Paul. And he says, hey, I, I, I believe you. Come on, come on in here. And he got to know Paul, and he got to understand Paul, and he encouraged Paul. And we know that's what we love about Barnabas. And aren't you thankful for Barnabas' people in our lives? Listen, that God uses all different kinds of personalities and different kinds of people, different kinds of gifts and different kinds of seasons. Listen, there are some people in your life, they're just Barnabas. And you know what the Barnabas, we know that he was called the son of consolation, the son of encouragement. He was just one of those guys, man, you're the best. You're, I mean, like he see you in the hall, be like, you're awesome, man. You're the man. I love you. And that was Barnabas, always encouraged me. Listen, I understand you need a Paul in your life, and we'll get to that in a minute. Paul would have been more of the prophet in your life, telling you what's up, speaking the truth to you in love because he cares and concerns. And Listen, you need that person in your life. Hey, hey, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we all need somebody to kick us in the spiritual seat sometimes. And then you need to have somebody come by after you've been kicked and go, you're awesome. <laughs> I mean, that was Barnabas. And, and I love the fact that Barnabas came up alongside Paul and he invested in Paul. And how many of you would agree with me tonight that Barnabas got an amazing return on investment, an ROI, out of Paul? How many of you would agree with that? Amen. But I want you to see something. Not only did Barnabas invest in Paul, what we see tonight is Paul invested in Titus. You, you have to understand something in verse 1. Titus was not coming along on this trip because he was Paul's luggage boy. That's not why he was on this trip. Titus was a significant man. And the reason that he was on this trip with Paul and Barnabas is he was coming to Jerusalem so that they could see firsthand the grace of God in the lives of Gentile believers. Again, somewhere along the way, what we understand is Paul encountered Titus, and Titus, as a result, encountered Jesus, and it made a difference in his life. And I see here how Paul had been invested in, and he took the investment that had been made in him, and he invested in Titus. But it doesn't stop there. What do we know about Titus? Not too long ago, we preached through the, the letter to Titus as a pastoral epistle where Paul is training and teaching Titus. And we know that Titus became the pastor of the churches in Crete. And, and, and here's what he says, in, Paul says to him in verse 5 of Titus chapter 1. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set us in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed unto thee. And so what we have here is you have Titus now, he is investing in the lives of the believers on the island of Crete. The investment goes on and on and on. And that is how we perceive and we see grace. Can I just say tonight, I wonder where Paul would have been at this point in his life if there had been no Barnabas to, to, to invest in him. I wonder where Titus would have been at this point in his life if there had been no Paul to invest in him. And I wonder where the Christians in Crete would have been at this time if there was no Titus to invest in them. And can I ask you this question tonight? Can you imagine where you would be if certain people had not invested in you? Because I guarantee you, everybody in this room is a product of somebody else's spiritual investment in your life. I want you to think about it tonight. Some of us tonight ought to come to this altar and get on our knees and thank God for parents who invested in us. 
Listen, I'm telling you, your parents, they tried to love you and train you and teach you. Many of you, your parents taught, brought you to Sunday school and taught you the Bible stories and tried to teach you biblical character, and they invested in your life. Do not shun and shame that investment that they placed in you. Some of you, maybe it wasn't your parents that did that. Maybe it was your grandparents. Man, thank God if you had a godly grandma or grandpa who had a tear-stained Bible, who knew the Lord Jesus Christ, and they cared enough about you to invest in your life. Tonight, maybe it's not a grandparent or a, a parent, but maybe there's a pastor that somewhere along the way invested in you and cared about you and preached to you and loved you and encouraged you and admonished you. Thank God for their investment in your life. Maybe it's a youth director that loved you and taught you and put up with you and, and, and went to youth activities and summer camp with you. Man, I thank God tonight for uh, Brother Wally, who was my youth director, a man who was working 50 hours a week as an engineer who would take personal vacation to take knuckleheaded teenagers like myself to camp on his own dime and on his own time, and he invested in my life. Praise God for that. Maybe tonight it's a dear friend. Maybe it's a Christian school teacher. It was somebody in your life that came alongside you and they were a Barnabas to you or they were a Paul to you or they were a Titus to you and they invested in your life. But it doesn't stop there. What about you? Who are you investing in? Who are you witnessing to? Who are you teaching? Hey, listen, a lot of us, we want to be encouraged by everyone and we don't offer any encouragement to anyone. Listen, that's not the way it ought to be. Who are you leading? And I want to just remind you again, I read this last night in a book I was reading. Leadership is not authority. You say, I want to be in charge of something. That's not necessarily leadership. Leadership is influence. Who are you influencing for the Lord Jesus Christ? Who are you praying for? Who are you praying with? It's a good time for me to just pastor everybody here. Listen, I'm all about talking about the ball game. I'm fine with that. Now, I know some of you don't want to talk about the ball game tonight. I, I understand that. But you guys had a good run. It was an awesome historic season. So nothing to hang your head about. But, I mean, it's just all fine to talk in the, in the hallway about, well, you know, if we'd have shot free throws better, we'd have won the game and this and that. <coughs> That's fine. Hey, if you hear a funny joke and it's clean, tell it. I love seeing slaps on the back and ribbon and poking. Listen, if, you're not, if I'm not making fun of you, I probably don't like you. You know, you know, I mean, like, it's okay to be like that. Uh, we want to have a family atmosphere and a jovial uh, 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 spirit here and those kind of things. But listen, you know what we ought to see around here? Is we ought to see every once in a while somebody over in the corner here or somebody against the wall here or somebody in the hallway out here. And when you're talking about, hey, would you pray for me? That you don't say, you know, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. You just do it right there. How many of you are like me? You just might forget to pray for that person. But if you stop and say, well, let's pray about that right now. Listen, Jesus said my house ought to be a house of prayer. So again, I'm just saying, who are you investing in? Who are you investing in? After a distinguished performing career, there was a famous violinist named Joshua Heifetz. And she accepted an appointment as a professor of music at UCLA. Somebody asked her, though, they said, why... why would you give up this amazing performing career to go into teaching? It was almost like they felt that she was, she was stepping down, but here's what she said. She said, violin playing is a perishable art. It must be passed on as a personal skill, otherwise it is lost. Can I say to you tonight, so is biblical Christianity. If we do not pass it down, somebody said Christianity is one generation removed from extinction. You want to perceive grace? You want to see grace? It's seen by investing in others. Number two, I want you to see this tonight. Grace is seen by cooperating with others. See, Paul is making a strong effort to show in this text that he is in agreement about the gospel with the Jerusalem leaders and that they are in agreement with the gospel with him. In fact, in verse 9, it says that they extended him the right hand of fellowship. Now, again, that's not just everybody getting together at church and shaking hands and hugging necks and slapping backs. There's more significance to that statement than just that. No, no what it carries is, is friendship, yes. Fellowship, yes. But also, don't miss this, partnership. Okay, we're in this together. That's, that's what that said. Uh, they were able to perceive and grace, they were able to perceive the grace 
And they were able to work together even though, don't miss this, here's what I observe and perceive, that there were different missions. Look at verse 7 again. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed on me as the gospel of circumcision was committed on Peter, I don't want you to misunderstand that verse. It's not that they're saying, well, there was a gospel for the Jewish people and a gospel for the Gentile people. That's not what the verse is saying. We know that by the context of chapter 1. We know that by the, 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 the context of the entire New Testament. But what he was saying there is there, there are not two different gospels. There are two different fields of ministry. That's what he's saying. These were different men. These different men had different backgrounds and different callings and different abilities, and they were working in different places. I, I, just a little humorous thing, I, I came across something that differentiated uh, the North and the South. You know, I, I was preaching somewhere not too long ago, and they said, oh, where are you at? I said, I'm in South Carolina. And they said, are you from South Carolina? And they, what they were asking is, how come I don't talk with an accent? Now, some of you that are homegrown, you, you, you got an accent, and you might look at somebody, I don't know, you might meet, meet Mike Ivanina and say, you ain't from around here, are you? <laughs> right? So there's been a rivalry between the North and South, and somebody said this, the North has coffee houses, the South has waffle houses. <laughs> the North has double last names, the South has double first names. That is true. Billy Bob, you know. The North has cream of wheat. The South has grits. The North has green salads. The South has collard greens. Now, this one's kind of mean. Some of you might not like this one so much. The North has dating services. The South has family reunions. That's kind, of, that's kind of mean, wasn't it? I know I've pastored in the Carolinas. I've pastored in California. And can I tell you, there are different cultures and there are different people groups and different ways of doing things. But there's one gospel message, even though there are different missions. Listen, I'm very thankful that people go to South Africa and Asia and different continents or they go in different regions of our different country and we need to recognize that grace is seen by cooperating with others let's, let's just make look there's a reason we do what we do here and I hope we have a biblical reason and a practical reason but we've got to also have enough grace to understand we're not the only ones doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ there are other people doing great things in other places with different ministries and they may not always do it exactly the way we would do it but grace is seen when you can cooperate. I'm not talking about doctrinal compromise. Some of you are getting a little nervous. I think I started the sermon pretty clear about that. I'm just simply saying recognize that there are different missions. But let's end on this. There's only one message. And they made that very clear. Now again, I understand that you may be better suited to minister to certain kinds of people. Listen, I've told you before, we got children's ministries here. Listen, if you're 86 years old and cranky, you don't need to be in children's ministry. Amen? I, I mean, I understand. Some people are just not, have the dis disposition for that. You know, I, I remember this guy wasn't old. He was just cranky. I remember my kids would come home and complain, yeah, teacher so-and-so, man, they, they don't like kids. Oh, really? Why? They're always telling us to shut up, and they're yelling at us. They're mean. They don't like us. I'm like, okay, you know? I mean, look, look if that's your disposition, maybe children's ministry isn't for you. Like, I'm okay with you understanding some people just aren't suited and cut out to work with teenagers. I mean, I happen to like teenagers, uh, but, I mean, there is a reason I got gray hair and Corey has no hair. <laughs> but I love these guys. I really do. I like being around them. I like hanging out with them. I, I get them and I appreciate them, but not everybody does. Listen, some people aren't very suited to work with senior adults. I mean, you understand, senior adults in a lot of ways are just junior hires with money. <laughs> I mean, there's men's ministries, women's ministries, young adults, 
addiction ministries, and the list could go on. But I'll tell you, it doesn't matter to me what the group is. Can I tell you, all of these groups need to hear about Jesus. They all need to hear about Jesus. And if we can understand, without compromise and doctrinal compromise, I understand that. That's a given. But if we can understand that we can do more working together than working against each other, then we can accomplish much for the Lord Jesus. Let's say that in the context of our local church. Listen, the nursery ought not be mad at the salt group, and the salt group not may be mad at the teen group, and so on and so forth. We are all working together for the same cause. And if we'll work together, we can accomplish great things for Jesus. I'll just close with this. I came across this little joke years ago. And the story goes this way, that there was a guy on the bridge about to jump. And another man came along and he said, don't do it. The man about to jump was in despair and he said, well, nobody loves me. And he said, well, uh, the man that approached him said, well, God loves you. He said to the man, he said, do you believe in God? And the man said, yes, I do. And the man that approached him said, are are you a Christian or are you a Jew? And he said, I'm a Christian. And the man said, me too. He said, are you Protestant or Catholic? And the man said, I'm Protestant. He said, well, me too. He said, what what franchise are you? And he said, Baptist. And the man said, me too. He said, are you Northern Baptist or are you Southern Baptist? And the man said, I'm Northern Baptist. And he said, me too. He said, are you Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? And the man said, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist. And he said, me too. He said, are you Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or are you Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern region? And he said, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes region. And he said, me too. He said, are you Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or are you Northern Conservative Baptist Region Council of 1912? And he said, I'm Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. And the man pushed him off the bridge and said, die, you heretic. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm trying to say is in so many ways we have so much more in common than we do in difference. Sometimes we just get real bent out of shape about those differences. I'm not preaching compromise tonight. Do not walk away thinking that. I'm just trying to be faithful to the text. And Paul said, I have a ministry to the Gentiles, and I may not do it exactly like you do it here in Jerusalem, but I'm preaching the same gospel. The same gospel. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus something equals nothing. And Peter and James and John walked away and said, he's preaching the gospel. And they extended in the right hand of the fellowship. And they were able to do more together than they were apart. And because of that, we perceive grace. We see it in action. Let me ask you some questions. Do you know grace? Now, if you're saved here tonight, I think you would say, yes, I know grace. I know grace. Well, then let me ask you, do you show grace? Do you show grace? Let me ask you a question tonight. Who has invested in you? As I look around this room, man, we have all been invested in. All of us have been invested in by someone. So the question becomes, who are you investing in? And I think this is a good question to end on. Do you work well with others? Have I mean, you ever seen that on a, on a job evaluation or a school evaluation? Does not work well with others. It sounds like some Baptist people I know. Listen, we just need to make sure that we know who the enemy and the opposition really is. And I hope that people that come in and out of our ministry, I know there's always going to be somebody that complains and doesn't see it the way everybody else does, but I hope by and large, when people come in, they can say like Spurgeon, you have practiced grace on me. They perceived grace. Why? Because they saw investing in others and they saw cooperating with others, working together to get the job done. Let's rejoice in the Lord tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts. Thank you for helping me preach a little bit tonight. And I pray that you would use the truth of God's word to root us and ground us in gospel ministry. Thank you for Paul and his testimony, his boldness and his strength, but also his grace and cooperation. And I pray that you'd help us to emulate that. But most of all, help us to emulate Jesus Christ who did just that. And I pray that you'd work in our hearts tonight. How many of you would tonight, you would raise your hand and testify and say this, Preacher, I am the product of somebody else's investment in me, and I'm so thankful for that. Would you raise your hand if that's you? Yeah, every hand. Then who are you investing in? 
you know, every one of us ought to have a Paul in our life and everybody ought to have a Titus in our life and let's make sure that we're doing that. Listen, there's some teenager, there's somebody in this room that you could invest in if you cared to. You could be a Barnabas in their life. You could be a Paul in their life. Why don't you pray and talk to the Lord about that? I mean, say, preacher, I want to have a heart that's cooperative, not a heart that's cantankerous. And pray with me about that. How many feel that way tonight? God bless you, I know. And we want to keep that spirit here in our church, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us do that. Let's stand together, please, as Miss Lindsay begins to play. If you'd like to come and pray and talk to the Lord, why don't you thank the Lord for those that have invested in you? Why don't you pray for those that you're investing in? Why don't you talk to the Lord a little bit about cooperation and unity in our church, in our school, in our ministry? And I pray the Lord will help us. Oh, I want to have a ministry of grace, and I want it to be perceived in my life and in our ministry, and I believe you want that too. She's singing a, or playing a great song, Grace Alone. We're going to put the first verse on there. We'll be dismissed in singing this. And I think it's fitting to dismiss in a hymn like that. And so let's sing this song. It's a newer song, not an old, old hymn, uh, but it's a great message about grace. And so let's sing it as Mark leads us tonight. As you go to work, as you go to school, remember those that know grace show grace. And I hope that your co-workers, your fellow students, the people that you minister to this week in encounter at the store, at the restaurant, that they will perceive grace in your life. Perceive grace in your life. And let's let our Sundays touch our Mondays. Hasn't it been a good day to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah, I almost feel like Peter right now. And it's good for us to be here. Let's just build a tent. We just stay right here. But I know you got to go home and those kind of things. But I hope you have a great week. And Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday. God bless you. You're dismissed.